In 2019, Roddy Rich hit a lick with the box. Fast forward four years and so did Guardiola, successfully steering Man City to a treble using a 32-41-32-23 shape, employing a box midfield structure. City's shape, at least superficially, appears to fall in line with a trend of teams positioning four of their players in the half spaces, in so doing creating what has been referred to as a box midfield. Arsenal, Barcelona and Liverpool are just some other teams regularly cited as doing similar in the past 10 months. It will then look at how teams might and do interpret box midfield shapes in the context of their respective game models and general principles. What advantages does a team gain by employing their box midfield? Is the box midfield a conceptual starting point from which patterns of play emerge, or a byproduct of ulterior motives? As a disclaimer, I have not reviewed any match footage in preparation for this article, which I have about a day to complete. As such, the scope of analytical depth is restricted to conceptual engagement with surface-level analysis of the techno-tactical particulars. References to relevant games will come from recall, and should be taken with as many granules of salt as you feel necessary, especially the farther these recalls stretch back. To the naked eye, box midfield shapes jump out because of their four man makeup two in the advanced half spaces, and two in the reserved half spaces. In that a lot of out of possession shapes employ two or three man midfields, an in possession box midfield shape allows a team to acquire a numerical superiority in central areas, 4v2 slash 4v3. Therefore, in order to circumvent the danger of having a numerical inferiority, defending teams regularly alter the structure of their shape to mark the plus one. That comes by way of the attacking team's box shape. Some of the ways this might be done are the following. I, dropping a midfielder further back, i.e. tasking a center back with stepping up, or e, inverting a full back. Importantly, all of these adaptations generate new space openings. Sterisk I right parenthesis asterisk often enables the in-possession team to gain territory in the building phase, as the defending team's forward slash wide player will drop to take up a more conservative position, in order to keep the distances between the defending lines small. Asterisk I right parenthesis asterisk will generate space in behind the upstepping CV. Asterisk E right parenthesis asterisk will generate space in the wide area vacated by the fullback, and so on. As the defending team is forced to alter the positioning of one slash several of its players to deny the in-possession team a numerical advantage in central areas, space is generated. The aim of the attacking team is to exploit that space opening. In this vein, the the box midfield shape also produces positional superiorities for the in-possession side, manipulating the structure of the defending block to get one or several of its players in more dangerous positions. It becomes tempting to view shapes or formations as fixed structures, especially when they are depicted as stills in the manner above. But little if any teams start, that is, from their defending structure, or their structure immediately upon recuperation of the ball, in their box midfield shape. Superiorities do not magically appear out of thin air as the two zis step onto the field. Rather, they depend on players' movements and counter-movements. Movements and counter-movements. How teams get into their box midfield shape can help us understand exactly why they do it. In the 22-23rd season, Arsenal typically got into their box midfield shape by inverting Zinchenko to form the second pivot with the LCB, RCB and RB shuttling laterally to form a three-man composition in the first line. City's setup was similar after jockeying between various setups between July and December. The Manchester side consistently employed a box midfield structure after the World Cup. At first, academy graduate Rico Lewis inverted from one of the full-back positions in a manner similar to Zinchenko, ahead of a back line of three, with the other full-back tucking into the first line. In the last third of the season, it was Stone starting from centre-back, who was tasked with stepping up into midfield. As a result, both of City's FBs tucked in. From their out-of-possession positions, both Zinchenko, LB apostrophe CM, and Stones, CB apostrophe CM, stepped into midfield as their respective teams possessed, via recovery or after circulation, the ball in their first third of the pitch. As such, the formation of the box midfield shape functioned as a means of facilitating the collective arrival of the team in the final third via incremental progression. A useful point of comparison here might be De Zerbi's Brighton, whose progression generally consisted of deeper build-up play, designed to manufacture space openings ahead, where after timely verticalization, would allow the team to arrive in the final third asterisk dynamicallly asterisk. Zerbi's Barker side were markedly different from the two English teams. Instead of a defender taking up the role of an auxiliary midfielder, it was their nominal left winger, more often than not Garvey, 
who would invert into the advanced left half space with a marauding bowel, shuttling down the wide leftmost channel to make deep runs. If those runs could not be found, the Catalonia side would typically build down the left through the use wide combinations, where after a switch could be made to an underloaded right hand side occupied by 1v1 specialist Asmain and Bell. Profiles. To start, both of Arsenal and City could rely on the horizontal connectivity, ball retention and general tempo setting capabilities of their pivot players, who, largely speaking, would stay put with their backs to goal, facing their first line. Even the stylistic differences in the building phases between the two English sides can be seen at the granular level when comparing the dissimilarities between their pivot players. Both of Zinchenko and Partey are more risk-heavy than both of Stones and Rodri, respectively. As a result, Arsenal were unsurprisingly more vertical in their collective progressive tendencies than City were over the course of the season. The Blograna side, on the other hand, usually employed Frankie de Jong as their second pivot position next to Sergio Busquets, a player whose preferred methods of enabling progression both individually and on a collective scale are achieved by abandoning the zone where pivots are tasked with pinning in possession. As a result, Barker's box midfield structure was much more dynamic than both of City's and Arsenal's. And this was reflected in the makeup of the Zai. Whereas Dembel would pin the opposite left back by asterisk OCCUPYING asterisk right high and wide zones, Bald would asterisk ARRIVE asterisk high and wide on the left, in the space that Gervi had purposefully vacated. Compare this sort of dynamic with the City box midfield structure and you may as well be likening chalk to cheese. In the 32-23 shape that City used in the run-in, both of Grealish, LW, and Bernardo, RW, stretched the opposition back line horizontally by remaining in wide zones. Subtle, staggered movements of the pair were relevant, as is the case in all phases of play, but significant rotations, movements and counter-movements, were negligible when compared to Barcelona. Rather, City's wide players effectively functioned as pressure release valves, prompting meaningful movement off ball in close proximity when they had it. The gravity of City's number 9, Erling Haaland, naturally engendered space to open up for the dual dash number 10's De Bruyne and Gundogan to run into. Another frequent pattern of play was the overlap from the ball side CM, creating the possibility for the wide player to carry into the vacated half space or thread a reverse through ball, into the path of the on-running number 10. Here, the footedness, wrong-footed wing is naturally more inclined to carrying horizontally infield, and temperament to risk-averse players, of the respective wide players, were significant in making this setup effective. Think back to Barker and neither of these phenomena hold. Though Dembele is more left than right-footed, his preference, and indeed, tactical instruction, is to take on his man by line, meanwhile. Bald is left-footed, and as aforementioned, arrives dynamically in high and wide zones rather than outright occupying them. Biker's penchant for verticality can in large part be explained by the makeup of its wide profiles, and left pivot player. Even despite the prima facie similarities between Arsenal's and City's setup, a closer look at player profiles goes ways towards understanding in-game patterns, and by extension, the ways in which these teams diverge stylistically. City's interiors were, significantly, a candidate for the most dangerous half-space threat in the world, KDB, and a player who thrives at 360 degrees angles, Gundogan. Arsenal's interiors, on the other hand, could not command the same qualitative superiority in the most congested area on the pitch for reasons listed below. And their reception tendencies reflect this. While Zaka and Odegaard would occupy the half-spaces for considerable stretches, they would also regularly shuttle out to zones 7 and 9, respectively, with Jesus a false 9 acclaimed for his technical qualities coming short to drop into the area that had been vacated. Both Arsenal and City's 32-23s had central numerical superiority as their starting points to generate openings in those areas. Cognizant of particular technical shortcomings that complicated this aim, deviation from that plan, via a pass out wide, was more of a stylistic feature of Arsenal's than City's. City could disproportionately focus on central incision as a means of progression and chance creation, due to the nature of their profiles in the final third, a fact that made those players superior pinners, and granted City more easy access to territory. Due to the absence of these pinners in central areas, Zaka, Odegaard, Jesus, Arsenal typically achieved progression via synchronized rotations and dynamic movement, explaining Arsenal's situational verticality. 
Funnily enough, in the pivotal game between the two at the Etihad on April 26, Pep opted to switch build-up structures entirely, from a 32-23 to a 424-4213 to incentivize deep build-up play and sporadic verticalization. Can the box, at least sometimes, pin? Now, look at Liverpool. While structural benefits of the box midfield shape did enable the Reds to garner more control, that was more to do with the presence of Trent Alexander-Arnold in front of a first line of three, compared to more ill-fitted receivers that Liverpool had trialled in that role after Thiago's injury early in the campaign. Notwithstanding the technical excellence of Alexander-Arnold, his temperament hardly resembled one of a typical controller you might expect to find in the second line. Rather, Trent's inversion enabled better collective retention abilities, itself a springboard for Liverpool to progress quickly. A feat that was more easily achieved by Trent readily occupying more dangerous positions in the half space. Significantly, Liverpool struggled to control the tempo of the game against Arsenal Trent's first game inverting, and only achieved that control after a drastic sway in game state. From memory, most of the teams Liverpool would go on to play against thereafter did not challenge Liverpool's build-up unit by using high presses. Trent was usually positioned outside of the opposition block rather than pinning it as a true pivot might be expected to. Given the increase increased distance between Liverpool's faux pivots, when compared to City or Arsenal's, for example, Liverpool's wide centre-backs would often exaggerate their width to create viable passing triangles, with the near-side pivot and CCB, a trend that would lend progression via central incision particularly difficult, and less regular, therefore, compared to the more situational shuttling of Zaka into Zone 7 as a reception option, Jones would consistently find himself there to facilitate wide progression. Central numerical superiority, and the pinning that comes with it, was not a fundamental starting point for Liverpool, as much as it was for Arsenal and City. However, a team need only derive tactical advantages from the numerical superiority that comes with a box midfield, rather than completely limit its progression to the half spaces, as was hopefully demonstrated by the stylistic comparison between Arsenal and City. After all, box midfield structures comprising wing backs instead of wingers are possible, wherein wing backs are regularly accessed as unmarked, progressive outlets, with the pitch asterisk AHEAD asterisk of them. Here, we might think of Tuchel's Chelsea lined up in the 32-41, where both James and Chilwell were into outpassing options as middle third connectors, a pattern of play that was only achievable because of the pinning abilities of Chelsea's box midfield. Even so, I would be reticent to assign too much importance to the in-possession advantages that come with a box midfield, insofar as it was or was not a fundamental part of the tactical identity of that Chelsea side, in large part because of the limited qualitative superiority Chelsea's number 10s could reliably command in the advanced half spaces. Or you might cast your mind back to the Liverpool City fixture at Anfield in October of the 22-23 season, where City employed a box midfield structure comprising Bernardo and Rodri as the pivots, with Gundogan and De Bruyne as the number 10s. However, rather than Bernardo stepping up from defence into midfield, City instead used an asymmetrical 343, with Foden, LW in settled defence, and Cancelo, RB in settled defence, as the wing backs in the building phases. In positioning two players, strong footed, it might be added, in wide zones in the building and connecting phases, Pep was doubtless concerned with accessing wide avenues for progression. Once again, however, this was only possible because of the pinning capacities of City's box, which functioned to overwhelm Liverpool's out of possession shape via a numerical superiority. Conclusions so, what might we able to conclude? Well, box midfield structures afford a team numerical advantages against conventional out-of-possession shapes, a fact that compels defending teams to alter the structure of their block, such that a significant space slash spaces can open up. Teams can then acquire positional and dynamic superiorities via effective exploitation of that space opening. Particular movements and counter movements among players are important in creating patterns of play that manufacture space openings and then exploit them. Crucially, the consideration of player profiles is paramount in allowing a team to derive some of the tactical advantages that come by way of the box midfield structure in order to avoid shoe warning players into an arbitrarily constructed box shape. At times, Liverpool did look to reap the benefits of its employment of a box structure at a lot of other times, they didn't. And lastly, with regard to the pertinence of player profiles in enabling tactical advantages of a box midfield shape, those of the box, shocker, are particularly important in being capable at least situationally, of pinning the half spaces. Teams that employ box midfields can and do vary significantly in their style of play. Shapes are cool and relevant, but the players are the tactics.